Hello everyone, it is I Dark Symphony 777 with another with the next part of my re-ranking of the old fan fictions I have reviewed. Uh, as always, please if you can, uh, leave a comment on the comment section below on your thoughts of any of these stories that if you if you ever read them, I actually do want to hear your opinions on it. And as always, like the video, subscribe to the channel. And also spread the word around. I'm always busy at work, so I never have time to like spread the word around. And again, I don't use Twitter, and I don't care. And I don't really care that much about getting big. But if I, you know, if you want, if you want to spread the word around, you can. If you don't want to spread the word around, you don't have to. I'm not gonna get mad if you don't. So let's get started. So, oh boy, let's get the big one. Let's we're we're continuing through 2018. Hercules and the Modern Girl. Oh, I remember this story. This story is so much fun. So, we have three seasons. We have one, two, and three. Okay. So, this story. I don't know if you read it. I would honestly suggest you come read it. Because it's a very entertaining story. It's actually one of my... It's one of my guilty pleasures. And I'm happy that the author is taking uh, her time. Because I know the author is a woman. Taking her time rewriting everything. Because I think... Uh, my main problem with the three seasons was exclusively season two. It's just season two was filler. It didn't really do much to progress the story, and that's probably the one, and that's the main reason why she's rewriting everything. I even try, even tried to tell her it's like you don't have to you don't have to change everything. And she's like, no, I want to. So okay, so the basic premise for these three seasons is there's the main character Natalie. And she's a big fan of the, Her of the Hercules Disney movie. She gets sucked into the world of Disney Hercules. But she doesn't appear in the movie. She actually travels back in the events list. Way before the events of the cartoon. Of the original Hercules cartoon from the, from the 90s. If you ever watched that cartoon. I would actually recommend that. It, that the Hercules cartoon was Really hilarious. I still have fond memories of it being massively entertaining. But she ends up going, she ends up uh, ending up in the, en around the entrance area of hell where Hades lives. Runs into Hades. She Hades basically takes her to the underworld. Talks to the Fates. The Fates reveal that, yeah, she's from the modern day. She's, she, in her, in from her perspective, we're fictional characters. We're fictional characters. And Hades is like, ah. Huh. And then we get the big overarching plot. Basically, Natalie is eventually going to have a choice. Either she teams up with, if she wants to go home, she has to actually carry out uh, nature, the, the canon events of the movie, because the end point is supposed to be the movie. Make sure the canon events of the Hercules movies play out, and she has to go home. Or she helps Hades uh, change the events of the movie, but she stays there. And basically, the whole the entire thing is, is basically like a love a love triangle between Natalie, Hades, and Hercules. Yeah, yeah. Hades starts getting feelings for her. Yeah, yeah. You may think it's cringe, but it's actually really well done because it actually they actually the author actually plays with the the idea a lot by just made, by not really enforcing this the romance. It's very it progresses very naturally over the course of the series. Like I said, my only problem with the Hercules and the Mongrel was season two. It was just very filler. It, it basically kind of kept like a repeating pattern. There wasn't really much in the way of progression, uh, except at the end where Cassandra actually finds out that Natalie comes from the future and basically tries to keep her a secret, tries to keep it a secret from Hercules and all that stuff, and tries to be there for her. It's it's very it's a very complex story, but it's really well done. Oh, hence why. Season two is like the weakest. I, I kind of overblew it. I said I should have probably put that at like a six. Uh, but when it comes to these three stories, I'm putting season one all the way bottom of S tier. Um, season two is going to be. Uh, bottom of B tier. Maybe minus. 
And season three is going to be S where where is it? It's gonna be S plus. I just I don't think this story is good enough to be a better off uh, season three is better off better off alone tier. And maybe because now the author is basically just instead of separating into what into seasons, he's he's just combining the entire thing into one long story. So I know for a fact if that if Hercules on the Modern Girl ever gets finished, I'm probably gonna have to review that because everything is being written written. So uh, so if it does, let's just leave that. At that. Okay, let's see. Come back for the other two when I'm done. Okay, so where am was I? Oh yeah, Super Smash. <laughs> oh, now I remember the story. Super Smash Bros. version of Pizza Delivery. It's literally just, just the episode of the SpongeBob episode of Pizza Delivery. It's just instead of SpongeBob and Squidward, you got some Smashers, including Sonic the Hedgehog, which makes no sense. <laughs> and this is a eh, right here. And it's just, it's nothing story. It's just, it doesn't do anything different from the events of Pizza Delivery. It's just there. Uh, Kidnapping and Dumble. This is the se- this is the sequel to Benjamin Chillins. I think this was this wasn't good as as Benjamin Chillins because this is more like a chase thing. But it's all right. I don't really have anything to say about it. See, easy see mice. Admitted my feelings up to here. Uh, this is a story that literally is in the Smash Brothers, but only features Mario characters because the author could apparently couldn't find where the Mario section is. <laughs> okay, so let me just. Here's the Smash Brothers, right here. And he said he couldn't find the Super Mario section. Is that? Is that? It's just five. It's just five sections below Super Smash Brothers. I wonder. Is this story? This the story has to be. I wonder. No, no. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I wonder, is the story still exist, or is the story? Oh yeah, it is. It still exists. The story's garbage. Oh, the story is just fucking Alice garbage. F tier, absolutely trash characters. Uh, absolutely shit pacing. Absolute shit plot. Uh, just the fact that the author could just doesn't know where. Hold on, does it actually, does it still have that? I wonder. Can't be. Yeah, it's still there. It's still a Smith. <laughs> still a Smith for this character. Yeah, it's shit everything. And then the author had the gall to be insulted when I point out the fact that like the story's garbage. Most importantly, it, it, you could just. Put it in the Mario section. Oh, you had your constructive opinion? I hate you for that. Okay. You want to have your opinion? That's fine by me. Uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, let's see. So, uh, social emissary bloopers. This is a, this is basically just a uh, parody version of the subspace emissary. It's all right. It's it's a one note. Yeah, let's put it now. Let's put it here. Let's see. It's a one note comedy story. The thing about comedy stories is once you read the story and and if they don't have enough substance behind it, they're just completely forgettable. And this is this is basically like that. It's just it's just a pure comedy story. There's barely any character development. There's barely any plot. It's literally just the plot of *Suspect Emissary*. Nothing really changes. Just there. So let's just move on to the next one. I'm moving. I'm I'm, I'm moving really fast. Uh, Donkey Kong gets uh, horrified by Yoshi uh, Rita Source. The legend, the myth, the man, the myth, the legend. Um, the, the problem is this guy. The thing with Yoshi C. Little Ritosaurus is he intentionally makes bad fan- he intentionally makes very cringy fan fictions. So you have to kind of 
judge it based on the fact he's deliberately going for these bad fan fictions. His most popular thing is just it's just fart fetishes. Why? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But I don't have anything more to say about that. It's just there's there's not much to it. Like, what do you what do you do to talk about? You always see the real source without bringing up the farts. You can't because that's pretty much. Not to mention he cut instead of like trying to go for quality, he just tries to rush out a bunch of fan fictions all, all the time. How many fan like how, you know? What? I'm actually curious. How many? How many has he made? Can't have made that many, right? I know he's made a lot. How many has he? I, it's been so long since I actually looked. He has made totally fucking shit. <laughs> I, I I was not expecting that. I, I was expecting a lot, but not that many. <laughs> okay then. Okay. Uh, let's see. Trick or treat. This was I'm trying to remember. This is the one about think about Lucas. Oh my god! I can't. I I actually forgot what this one was. Uh, Yeah. Uh, yeah. Spelling pro. This is uh yeah, how if Um Oh, it's basically like a pseudo political thing where they talk about where they talk about Samus either being a human or a chozo. I think it does also I think there's also a weird thing where like Ness reveals his trans. It's it's really weird. I consider it better than a minute my feelings because at least it it tries to do something, but not by much because everything just feels yeah. That's my pro yeah. Now I'm my, my problem main problem with that is just it was just way too rushed with everything, and thus it didn't feel like we were really enjoying anything. I'm just going to be <laughs> yeah, all these, yeah. Back half of uh back half of uh. 2018 wasn't really, didn't really have that many. I know there's a couple, because I know this is good. Let's see. Space Dude. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, oh no. Oh, no, I remember Joy. Oh, no. Oh, I, I, I remember, I remember your pick. So, Space Dandy by, um, by a friend of mine from the Philippines. I'm now remembering this story. <laughs> I'm now remembering this story. It's basically Space Dandy. They end up entering, um, end up entering My Little Pony. He's like, he looks at all these horses and he's just acting like Space Dandy. And I remember, I remember there's a part in the story where he's, he runs into a bat, uh, cockatrice and his and his and his uh, dick gets turned to stony and and and, and, Crow, and uh, Crow basically puts a picture of like him freaking out like <laughs> let me see if I can you know what let me let, let, let me, uh, let me uh, let's see yeah, that, no, there we go let's actually. There we go. There she is. Uh, let's see. Well, who says something? Let's see. Where? There it is. Yeah, it has a few things. Let's see. There is a picture of him. There it is. <laughs> when he realized. No! no! Why would it? I don't even. Re I don't even remember most of the stuff. I, I remember this, but this is so because the the, the build up and the execution of this one joke is just completely worth it. <laughs> I remember. I actually remember when I when I did the reading on this. I actually spent like five minutes straight laughing because because <laughs> the whole thing was just so hilarious. Um, let's see. Yeah. I don't remember most 
most of this. But that, that the will the, the Willie joke, that's just that's just worth it. Uh let's go. I'm put you in it. Put you right down here. Uh, okay, put you right down there. I already know. I already know where I think most of these go. Yeah. I think I, yeah, I know where most of these go. Okay, Jewel Line Chronicles. Uh, this is the Bowser Peach fic. Where they go where where the Koopalings convey, uh, kidnap Peach. No, the, the Koopalings pretend to get kidnapped. Uh, so that way Peach and Bowser can spend time together and, and get to hang out with each other. And Mario and like his friends are like following them. Um it's alright. I remember there was a I do remember there was a joke. Kind of doing satire on, on Mary Sue's on like generic on generic Mary Sue's. And that led to what was the what was the couple of name? Um uh yeah, Len, either Lenny or Lemmy uh basically kind of just talk getting her to talk about her painfully generic and emo ish story, taking out she's oh she's so plain, but everyone seems to worship the wall ground and then she kinda gets fallen uh jammed to a cannon and get fired into the sky. It's supposed to be a joke. Uh yeah, I would put that right here. Hey, I think it's okay. I think it's good. Not not great enough to go up here. But I think it's pretty good. It's a very predictable story. It's it's a it's a pretty weak romance now that I think about it. You know, let me, where is it? You know what? Um, yeah. But you know, let's let's put that down here. A minus. Yeah, it's a painfully weak romance. Yeah, it's a it's a weak it's a weak romance, but the story is pretty solid all around. Uh, let's see. Melancholia. Okay, this is a, this is better off one here. Uh, yeah, this one's a story about about Joe Kime Armister from Castlevania: Lament of Innocence, and how he became a vampire, and him having to put up with Walter Bernhardt, and eventually, and then kind of coming alive after Walter is defeated, and and kind of. Basically, just becoming an empty husk himself. It's a very, very tragic story, and I remember when I first reviewed this, I didn't put this, I didn't put it in the better off alone, but I retroactively put it in the better off alone because when I thought about it, I realized I under, I literally undersold this fan fiction. It's a really great fan, it's a really great fan fiction. Right up here, and it really tells a very heart wrenching. Tr like dramatic tale about the like Joe Con Homer, so the sick, the sickly royal who who's full of himself, being just broken down mentally and physically by Walter, and then kind of having force, basically trying to force himself to will himself up to anything. But but Walter keeps like overbearing him because he's Walter, and he's like completely charismatic because he's because he's Walter, and it's a very it's. I, I, can't, I can't do it justice here. I, I can't do the story justice. I just... I, I literally can't. Uh, let's see. Spidey and Kim. Yeah, this is basically just Kim Possible meeting Spider-Man. And, and also hearing uh, J. John Jameson. Eh, it's... Eh, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a... It is, it is a thing that exists. <laughs> hungry, hungry... He oh, yeah, this is the one where I actually imitate all their voices. And this is based off Last Story. I love Last Story. Um, this is just basically that how they made uh, their maid, their white mage, Morania, and found out that her big quality is like she's a big eater. And they basically is like, all right, we need a healer. We'll, we'll take you. All right. <laughs> and they kind of hang out with her, and they hang out with her, and then they get, and then they realize how much trouble she's worth, where she eats so much, and, and Dagger gets like the bill is like. Zale, what do you do with this? Well, that's the bill. That's Morani's bill. No, this is the bill for everyone. It's like, no, that, that bill is just for what Morani is eating. You're joking. You're not joking. Shit. <laughs> and I, it's, 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 I, it's pretty good. It's... I do eventually plan. I'm, I'm putting that right. No, I'm putting that right here. 
I do plan on on playing Last Story, so you'll have that. so eventually once I beat like Mass Effect, you'll be able to uh, probably play Last Story next. So that way you get to meet Morania and realize uh, how ridiculous she is. <laughs> she is a very funny character. I like all I like I like all the characters in Last Story. They're all really good characters. Um, Koopa Couple and New Dawn. This is I think uh, I think this is a Bowser story. Oh yeah, this was a this was about this was a Bowser Bowser story where they just hang out in. It's just a date, nothing really outstanding for what it is. I'm trying to remember. It was it was okay enough, so I'm gonna put that right here. But it was just a date, not much in the way of plot, which is fine. Uh, Blitz Knight. Okay, this was this was a chess match. I think it was well. I think it was well done and. I think I don't really have much more to say about this because it's it's more or less just a long conversation while they're playing while um, the two robins are playing chess. Uh, let's actually put that where yeah yeah let's put this in the A plus. I had to, I think that should go A plus. <clears throat> okay. I want to finish I want to finish these stories. Uh, Mother invention. Oh, this story. The Applejack gets stuck on an island. This this is a really good story. Um, this story basically has Applejack waking up in an island. She doesn't know where she is. She doesn't know how she got there, and it's just her trying to survive and also trying to find out not only get off the island but find out the mystery of what, what the island is and where it came from and what's on it. It's a very very well done uh, mystery that. That actually felt it. There's literally no other characters. There is characters like Me Applejack memory, uh, remembering all of the times she had with Phyla and everyone. But Applejack is what you get. If you're a fan of Applejack, go read this story. This is a really, really worthwhile single pony story, especially since, especially if you're a big fan of Applejack. Well, well worth the read. I'm actually gonna put that in the S tier because this is a great story. The whole secret of like. I think the SCP sort of monster, uh, the hidden bunkers, like her wandering around the, back to her own co only companions, like the rubber chicken that Pinky had from the cheese sandwich. Um, her memories, and like her her contemplating actually living there for the rest of her time, her life, because he's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm an island pony. But then Rick quickly realized, no, 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 that'd be the same thing as like giving up. That'd be giving up in a different way. It's, it's a really... Really thrilling. S S plus. S plus. Oh, they. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Equestrian Adventures of Billy and Grimm. Uh, this is basically. Yeah, basically Billy and Grimm uh, end up in Equestria some because Grimm does grim things. Uh, and then I think it ends with like. Rarity kicking Grim into the portal. I'm trying to remember, I think yeah, I think it ends with with Rarity basically just attacking Grim. If I remember right, uh, just C plus. It it's 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 basically just bootleg Space Dandy. Space Dandy basically in the same vein as the Space Dandy pick, written, written by the same author. Just not as not as good. I think I've reviewed all of Chrome's stories, actually, if I'm right. Then again, I'm friends with her, and she she's okay with me being fair to her stories. I'm not trying. I don't want to insult her and stuff like that. Uh, oatmeal. Uh oh. Oh yeah. The, the 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 evil living oatmeal. <sighs> this is bad. Yeah, this is a bad story. That goes right here. Just a plain story. Just it's just oatmeal. Uh, and the guy getting beat up because oatmeal. <laughs> uh, to Partonia. Oh, okay. So this is this is the weird one. This is the one I was actually thinking, trying to figure out what to do. So here's the thing with this story. It relies a lot on the singular theme of culture. 
and misunderstanding how culture works from different eyes. So basically, Rainbow Dash, Rarity, and Fluttershy, they go to, to another country to kind of get to know their culture, try to spread, try to get their culture, and they completely misunderstand how it all works. They kind of continuously insult everyone, and it it works. And I like and I like that it that it does play a portray uh, a realistic portrayal of misunderstanding how culture works and from others' eyes because it's it's that <clears throat> all three of them they actually genuinely want to know how the culture works and how t- how Peritonia runs and all that stuff from a culture standpoint, from a geographical standpoint, from a politics standpoint. But because they're equestrians and they run and they run things so differently, especially since each city they go to has their own subset of cult of culture, of religion, and, all, and everything that they keep kind of messing up because they keep not only they do they keep trying to compare it to equestrian culture, but they keep compared to the other cities they go to culture, and it, it kind of keeps wrapping them up that because they're but like I said, they're genuinely trying. They're not being insensitive. They're not being insulting. They're genuinely trying. They just don't know how. They just don't know how this thing works. Uh, my main problem with the story was the romance between Fluttershy and Rainbow Dash. It was really, really forced. You can tell the author just shoved it in there, just forcefully shoved it in there with like no riot, with like no way of like in making it even the remotely realistic. Like if you go read the story, and you notice like the moment they try, the author tries to do the romance thing with the, with Rainbow Dash and Fluttershy, you immediately tell it's it's forced. Like, I didn't even I didn't even get that far into the romance angle before I could even realize. It was it was that obvious that he was forcing it. But I like the plot. I like the plot. I like some of the characters. I like the, I, I like the core idea of the story. Uh, I don't... A, a minus. I don't like the romance. I think the romance... The romance just just did not need to be there. It was so badly handled. That's eight. Mega Man Iris. Oh yeah, Mega Man Iris because I love I love Iris in Mega Man X Four. Uh, so this is kind of a re- kind of a divergent alternate universe where Iris gets reborn into the world. So basically, the events of Mega Man Zero never happened. Iris wakes up in a museum and she basically finds out that uh, there's a bad guy. She basically, since she's the only one with even remotely combat experience, she's like, well, I'm, I gotta save the day. <laughs> and she befriends other characters. She, and honestly, Snake Man is there because he's Snake Man. No, he's not normal Snake Man. He's Dr. Professor Snake Man. All right. Professor, P, uh, PhD, archaeologist. <laughs> uh, it's a great story. I love Iris. Iris is like, I think the one problem I had with, with Mega Man X4 because, because of that we got that stupid what am I fighting for joke. What am I fighting for? <laughs> oh, I hope, I hope, I hope that's an, like an actual, I actually did the voice right. What am I fighting for? <laughs> Oh, it just made me pity Iris because I like Iris. Um, yeah, let's. I don't think it's great because the, the 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 beginning of it kind of starts. It starts out very weak, but once it picks up steam, it actually it gets it gets really good. Especially since you get to you get to know who Iris is, you get to know who. You have to know how Snake Man works. You get to know how uh, the other two main characters in the and the museum and all in the world there she's in. It's really it's done well, but not great. So I can't put it any more higher. Let's see. Oh, okay. The other Dark Foot Gloves uh, fix. Dueling for dessert. This is basically just Goofy Celestia not knowing how to play Yu Gi Oh. It's like you will know how to play Yu Gi Oh. It's like, wait, where are those monsters? It's like, well, they're called spell cards. That means they, they that means they must be powerful. But that's not how this game works. <laughs> All because they 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 are arguing over who gets to decide who who gets dessert. 
It's like, you always win. You always get cake. I love cake. I'm challenging you to a duel to change the cake. I love cake. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, this is probably the weakest of the story, but I like it. B, the rest of them are going to go up. Uh, Sonata's big duel. <clears throat> I like this. Sonata's using Gishki's. She's dueling. It has a very, very well thought out plot. It's based, it's not too long, but the duel is just is just long enough so you kind of know what's happening and kind of understand every. You're kind of being guided through everything. Dueling for dessert is just basically ridiculous. It's just a goofy, ridiculous thing. But this story, it kind of te- it kind of it kind of slowly introduces you to like the virtual mechanic with Sonata using Gishkis. Uh, Sunset Shimmer using uh, Resonators slash Red Dragon Archfiends. Uh, if you want to say now, she she probably go full no uh, Reson- Red Dragon Archfiend plus little balls. She probably use like the Laval, the new Laval stuff and stuff like that. Um, this one's a this one's a really good story, uh, especially Sonata's plight is realistic. Where where unlike unlike Ariana Adagio, uh, Sonata actually likes working at the taco joint, and she's like being offered. The management uh, position because she's so dedicated to the work, but it rubs Adagio the wrong way because like I'm I, I should deserve the management. You don't do anything, and basically Sonata is told by her boss saying you gotta let those you gotta let those two go. But if they were my sisters, you still gotta let them go. And basically Ad- Adagio kind of throwing them out and uh, and uh, and Sonata only dueling. Uh, sunset because she she desperately wants to go home because she's just she's just kind of given up on doing the taco life and everything and she just she just she just completely broken down and and kind of like a, a broken mess and then the story kind of ends with like the sunset and the rest of them the humane six kind of offering their friendship and Sonata just taking it and then firing a Dajio and Aria <laughs> so yes uh so this is a great story um Let's see. Let's go back down and get the last. Uh, Dueling the kid, save, save, save count of free. This one just kind of starts the main plot line that kind of uh, because the author is working through like a, an actual novel all these types of stories that kind of explores the world and everything and Duel the Save Can't Ever Free does start that. I don't like, I admit, I don't like the reference to Team 4 Star because um uh, a bridge Android 16 kind of shows up. It's like, pretty birds. I I will protect this camp. For the birds! <laughs> um, but I think the duel is good too. It kind of capitalizes on the main plot point of the dual spirits. And the idea of the dual spirits. Where each each character, dual spirits you have to earn. Anyone can have dual spirits. It's just a matter of earning the respect of the dual spirits through their own way of life. And every deck kind of has their own method. And the story culminating with, like, Sunchet finally earning, like, the respect of the Laval, cla- uh, the Laval clan. And basically offering themselves to be dual spirits for her. And it's really, it's really epic duel. It's also an epic duel with, like, the, the Monarch slash Wicked duelist and the tri- and the, um, the rank 10 player, uh, the rank 10 guy. Yeah, I'll put that right here. Not as good as not as no. Did I? Yeah, right here. This one. And then we get to the last one. Dueling for a chance. Hold on. By a lot of There we go. Two words. This guy delivering a falcon punch. I don't care what the rest of the story is about. Just that epic climax. So, okay, so for context, this this one takes place back in Equestria. Uh, Suri Polomir kidnap, uh, basically bullies, wants revenge for Rarity upstaging her. So she kidnaps uh, Sweetie Belle. Spike goes to try and save her. Spike fails to save her. And then challenges Rarity to a duel. Suri is playing Fred first. And Rarity is playing Vylons. This is what this guy's part of. And the ending is when she finally summons Vylon Omega. 
and they this the author goes out of his way just just massively built up just him showing up on the field. It's like he's I summon Final Omega, and so he just looks around. It's like I don't see him. It's like well, that's because he takes a bit of time to show up, uh, look up, and she look and she looks up and she sees Violet slowly just coming out of the clouds with the white halo, just slowly touching down, and he's as big as a fucking skyscraper, just standing over the damn thing, and he, he just he's just glaring at it. Sorry, he's like. Well, I win. <laughs> Final attack. And, he, and, but, and Omega just rears back his massive hand. And then just Falcon punches Suri on top of the building. It's mad. Honestly, what, read this story just for Omega showing up. It's it's suitably epic because I love Violent Omega. It's such a shame that he's part of Violence and Violence are not that good. We need we need more Violence support. But Violent Omega is just a bat. Just... Just Violet Omega showing up is just a badass moment in and of itself. And the way, he, you know, like, Suri tries to negate, it's like, aha, I can just activate this. It's like, no, I negate it. <laughs> it's such a great, it's such a great moment. I have to put this, uh, where is it? Yeah, totally for a chance. I have to, I don't think, I think it's as good as Sonata's Big Duel because the only thing, the only thing this one doesn't lack is a proper plot. It's just Suri just being a bully, kidnapping, sweetie, and challenging Rarity to a duel. Well, with Sonata, you had all the build up with like her getting the promotion, her being told you have to fire your sisters, her getting thrown out of the house and just her breaking down and trying to basically go home. And there's a, there's a plot behind it. So this one is just, Bully getting can up, come up in, but the duel is much better. This one has the best written duel out of all these. So yeah, let's go back down. Let's see. Five left. The Naruto Mysterious Power. This is just a goofy Naruto harem fic. Thankfully, it's not erotic. It's mainly just comedy. I already know where this is going. Okay. Right here. There's not really a lot going on. It's just... Naruto be acting like Naruto and just slowly getting a harm through no fault of his own. He's not even actually trying to get a harm. They just like, you're so funny. <gasps> Meanwhile, uh, an older version of Naruto is trying to re fix the, the path, uh, fix, repair the future because Sasuke and Sakura, they become like truly evil and, and he's trying to prevent that from happening. And he even said, and he, I think he even implies to sacrifice himself. He was like, yeah, the timeline's gonna change, but it's like, yeah, I can deal with that. <laughs> After all, I got about eight or nine hot babes. <laughs> I can deal with that. Uh, I'm gonna save this one for last. Uh, delivering the package by Chrome again. Uh, this is this is just basically I'm putting this up higher because in the yeah, putting it right here. Because of uh, the fact that this one's kind of like a very, very short choose your own adventure style story. It's just dirt. It's just derpy who's delivering a package. Nothing, nothing too big, nothing too extravagant. But it, is, it does have some jokes into it that you that you might like it. You're a wizard, derpy. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, Sadie's Tale. This is honestly, this is a, this is a, this is up here. I don't really. I was very generous. I was even very generous given with the, the number two, two out of 10, I mean, two out of five. It was just two mice just hanging out and doing more or less nothing. Uh, Luke Bugardi from Keanu Yoshida. Um, this is, uh, this is actually, I'm at, after this story, I actually used her YouTube channel name because I think she would actually want, prefer that. Uh, this is the one about the girl going into the, uh, events the Phantom of the Opera, and then just meet, and then she finds out that she has like multiple personality disorder. It's a really weird story. I don't hate it, but I don't think it's great. I'm gonna put that, put that right here. The Bigarde, that's yeah, yeah. 
it's a it's a good story, not a great story. But I don't really have much to say about it besides the whole uh, besides the whole little personality disorder thing. Uh, she was abused, but I think the I think the abuse could have been executed better at the beginning. Uh, that was before she ended up in Phantom of the Opera. Uh, finally, fall out of crush your pink eyes. There, there you go. Um, wait. I'll do that after. Uh, yeah, Fallout Equestria, Pink Eyes. This is the... Right here. <clears throat> this is the one about Puppy Smiles. Uh, I really like to execute the idea that Puppy Smiles is actually a one-dimensional character done right. She doesn't grow as a character. She doesn't develop as a character because... She's a ghost kind of stuck in a moment of time. And so her mem her memory is literally stuck in that moment of time. And so she's basically, her body's 200 years in the future, but her brain, but her memories and mindset is 200 years in the past. So it's a really creative whiplash. And also why she doesn't develop as a character because she, she quite, but she literally cannot develop herself as a character because she just can't. That's just, that's kind of, the whole point behind her. I think that's a really creative idea. The story is just is only like I think like 130,000 words. I can't I can't remember how long the story was. But it's a great story. It is a it is a spin-off of Fall of Equestria. Basically the events of Fall of Equestria is happening in the background. So basically the events are actually happening. Puppy Smiles is just doing her own thing by herself. Just wandering around, making friends, making everyone remember the good old what Equestria used to be like and just being a puppy just being a, the most adorable ghost in the world. Like, hi, I'm Puppy Smiles. Want to play? Oh, you're so adorable. Wait, why is that pink gas coming? Ow! <laughs> so, yeah. I, I, I like Puppy Smiles. She's a great character. And this story is really good. I do like the reference to... Um, this story also contains, like, a very, very funny reference to uh, Spaceballs. Where, like, uh, Greta, the, the griffin, is basically playing with... Uh, Playing with Puppy Smiles because Puppy Smiles had like a mental breakdown and she's like playing with him, playing with her like uh, like what Lord Helmet does and he even does and even she freaks out. It's like no, next time. Did, did you see anything? No, I didn't see you, uh, Phantom Mine with uh, the little the little girl. Go, go. <laughs> it's a great story. I don't have anything bad. To say. I don't have anything more to say about this. I don't have anything more to say about any of these stories now because I'm on, I'm finally on 2019. I have, oh my god, no, Let's see, how many stories do I have left, how many stories, uh, 76 stories left. So yeah, I will see you next time when I when I go through 2019 and finally finish the rest um, this year that year, and then finally I'm gonna do the rest of it behind the scenes, so you don't have to worry about that anymore. But I'll see you next time. This has been Dark Symphony 777, and cut. <laughs>